It's going to be 100 degrees, so I think they're going to need water. Let's see once you get in here. This will be out of the sun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty well dust up there around the water, huh? Yeah. A few years ago, I was out here in northeastern Nevada to work on a, on a wild horse project. And I remember waking up and seeing hundreds of wild horses coming in from every direction. Just battling it out for a drink. That was such a transformative experience. And I think in that moment, I developed that curiosity that I think really pushed me as a scientist. There's like at least another 50 that are just walking out of the mountains. We're back here to really try to understand this whole like wild horse situation. And specifically the effects these wild horses are having on wildlife, our public lands, and these ecosystems that we all rely on. It seems like these horses are coming in from every direction. I mean, do you think this is the only water source? Yeah, there's probably no other water, probably for five miles wow. around here. So what, what would happen if this spring dried up? A lot of them would succumb to not having the resources to survive. You know, Nevada has more wild horses than any other state, and yet it's the driest state in the Union. So everything is focused around water. You know, the antelope, I don't know if they're I let them come in and get a drink too. The competition exists between user groups, horses, livestock, wildlife. Anytime you're reducing the amount of food on somebody's plate, then things are gonna get bad at some point in time. Nobody wants them to suffer. Nobody wants them to suffer, huh? They're trying to just live. Yeah. And it's usually, it's us. It's we as humans that aren't acting appropriately and managing the rangeland resources appropriately. And this is, so this should have vegetation. Oh, it should have, yeah. The abuse and, and lack of vegetation is just due to trampling. And so we've lost most of those environments just to overuse and had to transition into more of an exotic weed type environment. I mean, you can't give up, right? And we've just got to keep charging and speak for those uh, species that don't really have a voice. We're setting out to meet up with some wildlife experts who have dedicated their entire careers to studying these ecosystems. We want to understand how wild horses are impacting not only the sagebrush community, but also species like the threatened Lohan cutthroat trout and sage grouse, a bird that could become endangered if its habitat continues to decline. What would you say the key driver that transformed this place from a vibrant ecosystem into what we see today? Well, the fact there's no vegetation is the result of grazing, yeah. We're looking at bare dirt here. We'll see a bit later what this should look like if it was a healthy meadow. Grouse and other species need to have green vegetation for mostly for the young. If they don't have a place like this where they can get access to green vegetation, you don't have sage grouse. Wow. We're coming down the road, not even expecting to see you know, sage grouse. And there's maybe 30 sage grouse. They are so perfectly adapted to this ecosystem. 
So that's, that, those are my first ever sage grouse I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, pretty stoked. I think that's the really fun part about getting the chance to go chase sage grouse with you guys and see this ecosystem because so much of the narrative is a horse narrative. And it's like, wait a second, there's a lot more out there than horses. Yeah, I'm excited for you guys to wake up in the morning and look around and see where you are since we came in at night <laughs> yeah. and contrast it with where we were earlier today. Yeah. A big meadow with really lots cool. of grouse. <laughs> lots of grouse. Yeah. I'm excited to see this meadow. Horses are completely excluded and cattle are managed and only allowed to graze at the end of the summer. There's a doe mule deer walking near the tractor. And she's got two little spotted fawns. There's two other birds flying. They're gonna land in the sagebrush behind us. Oh yeah. There's two. There's one right behind her, about 10 feet walking. So cool. <laughs> you see their little head, they're just like on a swivel. Water is the limiting resource for not just sage grouse, but all of these animals out here. These meadows become critical. But you can't have a high density of pressure that's unchecked and the fences here show that. That's correct. These meadows are kind of like the beating heart of the sagebrush ecosystem. It was clear that a healthy meadow supports a healthy sagebrush community. So Rambler's kind of new to our family here. We haven't really gotten to know him yet. He's a gilding from Nevada. So was it horses or public lands first. What was your first love? Uh, the health and well-being of the public lands is my first love and the most right. important thing. And that's what's really at the heart of the issue in wild horse and burrow management. It's about the health of the lands and taking care of them for diversity and wildlife and for future generations to enjoy our public lands. There hasn't been one day in the Bureau's oversight of this program that it hasn't been caught in between polarized public opinion and extreme controversy in how BLM should be managing horses and burrows. BLM's adoption demand is way down, adopting about 4,000 a year. Congress is either going to have to decide that we either care for unadopted animals the rest of their lives, or they're going to have to decide on some other disposition for those animals. And those choices are very, very controversial. The western rangelands don't have an unlimited capacity to support wild horses. We're gonna go see some trout. I'm not, ooh, not quite sure where we're gonna find trout, but we're with a trout biologist. So he's gotta know where we're going. There is a little creek down there. We're gonna go meet up with Cody and Jane and they have a few streams in mind where they have these endemic native trout, Lahontan cutthroat trout. How rare is this system? How many that you know of in northern Nevada, which is your expertise? Systems like this that don't have uh, intense grazing impacts are relatively rare across, across northwestern Nevada. The Black Rocks is one of my favorite ranges for that reason. If there's any metric that will tell us about 
the impacts of our horses or the state of these landscapes. It should be these riparian corridors where we're told the hot and cutthroat trout still lives. I think we should be good. Try to find a fish now. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> we go side by side right here? Yep, exactly. There he is. Got him. Got him. Nice job, Charles. Yep. So cool. Pretty awesome. That's a life highlight right there. Seriously. This is about a four inch fish. Dude, thank you so much. <laughs> Good job. That's awesome. That's a beautiful fish. There he is. On. Got him, got him. Oh. Nice job. That's an adult Lahan cutthroat trap. That's such a beautiful fish. And you're saying like when it's overgrazed, you lose that complexity, you lose that habitat. Ex exactly. It's why a lot of these small mountain streams can be so sensitive and so easily impacted grazing impacts from horses and livestock. Yeah, I think the drive in here is one of the driest, most arid landscapes I've ever driven through. And then you get here and you're like, what? There's like a full on aspen grove creek with trout in it. Stoked we did because it's not 100 degrees and in a sandbox. <laughs> so after we saw the pristine creek, we went to a place where livestock are managed by density and time of year they can graze. But the horses graze year round and in this area there's hundreds over the target population size. As we were coming up this mountain, I mean, we're way back here and you could see these trails from miles away. It's obvious that years and years of hundreds and hundreds of horses made them. And it was like we kicked a beehive, you know, there's just horses just pour, like literally pouring out of this drainage. We could see they were all confined right down on that spring source that's right below us here. And we're just seeing them trail up out of the bottom here. And that constant pressure is what begins to break down the spring complexes that feed these drainages. And we can see the impacts of grazing as we begin to look at the severe bank alteration and hoof trampling in here, which continues to spread the water flow out wider and wider. Like a fish could not live in that. Right. To think that this place, yeah, is at the mercy of policy, is at the mercy of a social conflict with how to manage wild horses. The fact that these fish are caught in that crosshair, it's a pretty gnarly reality that that, that could all go away. The program is in its worst shape ever in its whole history. Drastic measures need to be taken as we move forward. The worst case scenario is that the herds continue to increase, the health of the public lands continues to decline in condition, and that the horses on the range and wildlife would begin to die of starvation and thirst as the resources are unavailable to sustain them. If we did manage horses appropriately to appropriate levels, all resources would benefit. Horses would benefit, wildlife would benefit, and the land, the overall rangeland resources would improve. Anything more than just a wild animal that's just trying its best, you know. It's cool to see them, I'll admit it, you know. Even after everything we've experienced, like, you can't, that's cool, that's powerful, there's something there. If the status quo continues, you know, and this ecosystem continues to fade, I think I'll feel, you know, I think really let down by humanity. In the model that's unfolding today, nobody's winning. And that's, I think, the main thing I've learned.